Okay, so thank you very much uh, for inviting me uh, to this discussion forum. And at first, I would like to tell you how my approach, where my approach is based uh, when I talk about uh, Holocaust and social media. So my um, focus is on trauma in the digital age, and I'm writing a book about it, and I look at different different social media platforms. So I'm, as opposed to Mikola, looking at big data and like at the whole picture, I'm just kind of a user researcher and I look at social media platforms and I'm using them. And like manually, I collect uh, instances where, um, for example, Holocaust tra trauma appears on Facebook. So I study the impact of the digital environment on trauma it's in individual, collective, and historical trauma. And I look at how social media networks since the 2000s have changed the way people are regularly exposed to content related to traumatic experiences. So this is a major change that you don't need to view television or read newspapers, but uh, uh, traumatic content, uh, you meet tra traumatic content on your Facebook feed every day. And there are changes in how people react, how trauma transmission happens on social media, and also social media platforms can become platforms for, for processing trauma. And this is what happens uh, on Facebook in relation to uh, Holocaust trauma. But at first, I would like to share with you two, I have two hypotheses. One of them is uh, Online platforms can change. Uh, they from the shift from silence, which was uh, predominant in the pre-digital age, to digital trauma processing via sharing. So, like the, the very common uh, language and communication and gestures on social media, sharing and commenting are able to overcome this main uh, problematic. Uh, uh, element in trauma, which, which is silence. I'm saying in my research that silence can be broken in how people communicate about trauma on social media, whereas it does not always happen in real life situations. And the second and the more important for me at this stage of my research, the second hypothesis is that indifference uh, the wall of indifference that would lead to secondary traumatization will not be built on social media. Those unable to comment or to recognize the trauma of the other will remain silent, but their silence will not be noticeable online, as it will not be taken as and having an effect as unrecognition of the trauma in question. Because if we think about like uh, Holocaust uh, survivors returning to their homes, which were many times taken by others and they didn't have a home anymore. And they went home from the camps and the societies weren't able to accept their trauma. There was a denial st state also, the people who were uh, there, they were also traumatized by the war. And so there was no acceptance and that was another level of silence. And what I'm saying is that this kind of interference will not happen on social media. So these are my case studies. I just very briefly show it to you. So there are bystanders and catastrophes and uh, migrant blocks and uh, first world war trauma revived on YouTube and uh, tweet testimony chains on Twitter. And there is historical trauma processing in Facebook groups. And this is like for us for today's discussion. So there are these uh, Facebook groups about the Holocaust, which I follow in Hungarian and in English. I'm sure some of you know some of groups and there are a lot of different uh, people who are members, different age groups, and many of them are uh, survivors or second or third generation survivors. And. Uh, and now I'm coming to this Hungarian case study, how it started in Hungary, that people started to talk about the Holocaust on Facebook. It happened in uh, seven years ago, 
when the Hungarian government elected this so-called monument of the victims of the German occupation in Budapest Liberty Square. And this monument is the official monument and it's a victim narrative, uh, to, like the message is that uh, this is Germany's, um, uh, the occupation, the German occupation was forcing Hungary to take part uh, in, in the Holocaust and in the, um, that's how the Hungarian Jews uh, were taken to Auschwitz. And the people, uh, civilians, got together at first on Facebook and they uh, created uh, this living memorial, which is still there in Budapest. So if you do go to Liberty Square, it's seven years and it's still there. And I think there was only one attack, uh, one time when someone was trying to take in this part and it's there. And uh, it's the living memorial where people bring uh, uh, stones and pictures and documents and plants, and they try to tell the other side of this uh, history, of this story and, uh, and the other variant of history. And after this, two other Facebook groups were created. One of them is called Holocaust and My Family. This is a public group with 8,000 members, and they are uh, very, um, uh, determined group, they have, they set copyright rules for referencing how you can quote from this group the same as, as if when you cite a publication. And they were like oriented towards an outcome, towards a closure, towards sharing family stories that have not been shared before in the decades of communism where uh, Holocaust was a taboo topic in Hungary. So they had readings, open events, and they finally published a book uh, which is like a sel selected uh, posts and the very interesting stories. And uh, and this is all based on the face group group. And this, uh, if you compare this group with another group, which is like, it has overlapping membership and it has like almost 6,000 members. And this is a very emotional group. This is more about identity and who belongs to this group, the descendants of the victims and survivors of the Holocaust. This is a private visible group, which was previously called, uh, called closed group on Facebook. And it's very interesting to see how the, the um, characteristics of the Facebook group define communication within the group, even when the topic is the same, when the people who are members of the groups are basically the same, and they talk about the same issues, and still communication is different according to the group. So in the public group, the communication is oriented towards closure, and in this group, they, they have a lot of um, disputes, some people leave, they come back, they talk about who can be a member, who has the right to be in this group, who belongs to this group. And uh, there's a lot of distrust. And this is, for example, these uh, three quotes are from an old lady and, uh, and she's a survivor. And of course you can see a kind of um, digital non-literacy issues because when she says many new members disappear, it's, uh, it's like she's not used to people joining a Facebook group and then just not being active in that group. But there is a resonance of the memories of people disappearing, the distrust and how she's like asking, asking Christian friends who joined us to let them why they are with us. In the other group, there wasn't anything. Like I haven't met any of uh, such occasions. And then there is um, one uh, case study which I will not have the time to share with you in full, but this is a very interesting case study when someone uh, came out in both groups uh, saying that he was a descendant of a perpetrator, that his grandfather was a perpetrator. And he told his story in both groups. In the first group, like people uh, accepted it calmly. They thanked him. They said, uh, how good that you came forward. and. Uh, there was no big issue in the other group. Uh, there was a big upheaval and all sorts of comments. And uh, it, the comments uh, centered up on uh, belonging, on identity, again, on who has a place in this group, how can perpetrators and victims meet in the same fa Facebook group. And there were people who were saying uh, he, this 
person has a place in the group and some other people said like this one, I wouldn't say that you had a place in our group. And um, again, you are not in the right place. My victims will never reunite with the souls of hangmen. Uh, and there is no forgiveness and no peace with, between murderers and victims in any way. You can see it's a very tense and emotionally loaded conversations that go on in this group. And this is like, I, I like this quote very much. This is tough. It took my breath away. The first Hungarian to apologize for the crimes of his grandfather. And then there is this other person and he asking, I am requesting him to stay bear patiently and without anger if he's attacked here. There isn't anybody else whom those in deep pain could stone. They are using this language, it's like an elevated language, it's a lot of uh, reference to, um, to the Bible, to the Jewish culture uh, legacy. And then they also reflect on how it is possible to meet in virtual space. Um, yeah. So I think I'm running out of time, am I? Like two more minutes, do I have? One minute, okay. <laughs> okay. Anna, Anna, you're fine in time, why? Sorry, that was a thumbs up, not a time. You, you feel free to, to, to finish in your time. Okay, uh, okay. so you, you just can have a look at these uh, uh, quotes about exclusion, about who can exclude who, uh, who can be close to perpetrators, and then someone saying perpetrators are victims as, as well. And uh, nobody is born to be a sinner. Okay. And then, uh, so, uh, yeah. And then some people are kind of more educated and they're saying it is everyone's own business, whether they are willing to get upset and start to produce post-traumatic symptoms. But, uh, Stress can be inherited on both sides and perpetrators are also under, under stress. And the other person, I'm ashamed, why are we doing uh, this we and them separation? We and them separation is uh, like in trauma theory is the basis of like trauma, uh, uh, traumatic societies, how the groups split according to identity. And then this person, uh, last he finishes the discussion and uh, says, I feel that we have spoken enough about this story. We could surely discuss many similar stories about uh, the gendarme, the arrow cross shooting people into the Danube, uh, all Hungarian granddads. So this is how discussion ended. But um, I just would like to show you these three quotes and end here. So that's how I think social media and Facebook specifically about the Holocaust changes communication and silence and indifference can be changed. The first uh, quote is about is from a memoir, Holocaust memoir, and it describes how it would feel for people to talk about the traumatic event. Because if they start to talk about it, then the emotional, uh, the emotional, um, uh, loadedness would come through and it would not stop and they would lose control. So they would be re-traumatized when they would start talking and will not be, and as she says, able to speak in your usual tone, only hiccup and shout, may tear off your clothes and pluff your face with your own fingernails. So all these uh, grieving symptoms and deep trauma symptoms would come out, she supposes, if they started to talk. That's why they kept silent. And then again, this quote, this is tough. It took my breath away. So the first Hungarian to apologize for the crimes of his grandfather. So it's possible to talk about trauma on social media. And that's, that, that brings the hope that maybe from the Ali Visa quote, the third quote, maybe indifference can also be changed and people would uh, turn to victims with more empathy. Okay, so thank you so much. This was my 